Right, church, how you doing this evening? Great. Wasn't that worship great? I mean, we have a great worship team, teams actually, and I just want you to know these guys work really hard. They're always working at their craft to uh, just lead us into the presence of the Lord. Just want you to know they, they dedicate a lot of hours, so we really appreciate what they do, don't we? We really, really do. This guy's great. All right, turn your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 6. If you're following online, you follow along with us as well, whether you've got a Bible or an electronic device. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. By the way, as I was thinking about the lyrics in that one song about uh, just how the Lord loves us, whether it's the fatherless and how he takes care of the, in one of the earlier songs about uh, the, the mother and just how God cares about family. Of course, that's what we're looking at tonight. And just let me mention to you, starting uh, August 15th, so Friday, August 15th, for five weeks, our Praying for Prodigals is going to be having a class. We have a Praying for Prodigals ministry, but they're offering a five-week class, and you can sign up in the connection booth. I'd really encourage that. I know that there are a lot of families in our church that have prodigals that are hurting, and they just want, you know, some support and encouragement and prayer, and you can get that. And uh, so you can sign up in the connection booth. All right, hopefully you're at Ephesians chapter 6. Let's begin with prayer. Lord, we just want to thank you to tonight that uh, we are your children and that you care about us. You, you're intricately involved in our lives. You know the, the hairs on our head. Even when we were in our mother's womb, we were fearfully and wonderfully made. And, and, and so, Lord, as we now grow up, and many of us now are parents with children or grandparents and Lord, we, we look at the state of the family today and uh, there are just so many concerns and we could become just so overrun with negativity and disappointment and yet, Lord, there's always hope. There's always hope as we have our eyes on you. And so we've been looking at marriage over the last few weeks. Now as we focus on the family, we pray for just your guidance and direction, even in this brief time. It's such a short amount of time to try and talk about so many issues, but we pray for your guidance by the Holy Spirit, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are continuing our series we've entitled God's Design for Family and Marriage. And uh, in the last two studies, as I just prayed, we've been concentra uh, concentrating on the role of the husband and the role of the wife. And listen, if you weren't here for those studies, I really encourage you to go online, listen to them, uh, or watch the videos, or get them on the podcast. But you know, these are things that we need to uh, you know, be growing in all of the time. Um, even if your marriage is great, um, I know that there are principles in there that probably hit on almost all of us because marriage is something we're working on daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. In fact, if you're married, you've got to work on it all the time. It's hard work, but God honors that hard work as we put him first in our relationships. So tonight we come to God's design for the family. And of course, no one has to tell us that the family and certainly in America is under attack. Many of you here are from broken families. Um, you know, most of you, or I should say probably half of you, probably come from a divorced uh, family, and maybe you've gone through divorce or your parents went through divorce, and, and that causes so many problems. Um, in 1910, one-fourth of the nation's population had been divorced. In 1910, that was 83,000 couples. That's not a lot of divorces. 1982, it, there was a recorded 1.2 million divorces. 
And as I mentioned, today, half of marriages will end a divorce. Um, I did come across a study, though, that showed the effects of divorce. We know that it affects children, but one study, five years after, were after a divorce, on the children. Uh, the findings were eye-opening. Just one statistic I'll give you. Uh, 37% of children that have, you know, their parents have divorced deal with depression, unhappiness, sexual promiscuity, drug abuse, petty stealing, alcoholism, intense anger, apathy, restlessness, and in a sense of unremitting neediness. 37%. That's a, that's a lot. We, we don't want one person to feel that way. So divorce has a lot of effects. And, and today in America, less than 7% of people in America would, lit, would be involved in what we would call a traditional family, where the father goes to work and the mother works in the home. Half of the workforce in America today are, are women. And so that said, most kids in homes today grow up either where there's only one parent or both parents work which of course equates to what we started you know, some 15 years ago, the latchkey children problem where you have children coming home and there's little to no supervision, which of course equates into so many more problems. As I see it, there, well, there are two major attacks on the family today. Of course, there are many. We can go into a lot of sub-issues, but I would say first of all is the curse of sin, just the everyday sinfulness we, we deal with. But then the attack of the worldly system on our, marriage, on our marriage and our family. First of all, just sin. We all have to contend with sin. We're all born into sin. And then two sinners get married and we birth sinners. We're, we're multiplying sinners, right? We pass our genes, not our Levi genes, but our sinful genes onto our kids. So that we have this perpetuation of sin. And it's hard enough just to keep a family together when we have to deal with our own sinfulness in a marriage and in a family. But then secondly, when we have to deal with what I would call the Satan-inspired humanistic system of our day, it really gets tough because Satan just wants to undermine our families. God wants them strengthened, and Satan looks for everything he can to just attack it and undermine it. I mean, he does that in so many ways. I mean, now, of course, we're living, you know, this is 2014, and so 99% of families in America have television sets. Good grief, you can go to third world countries. Everybody's got a TV. But now we've been dealing with all the stuff that Satan uses over the years, right? All the program. We all have to go, I can't watch that. I can't watch that. We have to move from this. Oh, I don't like that commercial. I mean, we're dealing with that all the time. But now we've been dealing with the Internet for a good period of time. And, and there are good things that come from the internet. I love it. I use it as a resource tool all the time. But then, of course, we know the evil of the internet, not the least of which is, and of course, the top is pornography. This is a huge problem in the United States. It's a $12 billion industry in the United States alone. But here's a tragic statistic. The average age of a child's first exposure to pornography now is 11 years old. That's just, you know, I read that, and I was like, ah, just sickening. And, of course, they're younger. But the highest consumer, then, rate of Internet pornography is age 12 to 17. That's where the bulk of it is. Now, of course, there are other adults and so forth, but that's the large bulk, and that, again, undermines the family. Beyond that, we have all the violence that's on TV, as I mentioned, and even video games. And, of course, scientists have proven this does cause violent issues. We have to deal with the textbooks that our public school systems give our kids. And I don't have the time to go into some of these. It's, it's just mind-boggling. And then we have to deal with the fact that schools hand out con condoms to kids. They encourage promiscuity. Homosexuality is just an alternative lifestyle. So you add up all those things, and there are many more, and we realize this humanistic system has an attack on our family. So that said, with all that, and there's so much more, and, and that you know of, you can't just sit back as a parent today and just say, you know what, if we take them to church and they teach them in Sunday school and we talk about the Lord from time to time, they're going to grow up just fine. No, not at all. I think parents today have to be so proactive and commit themselves to raising their children in the admonition of the Lord, or they're going to have problems. And listen, there's no guarantee that if you train them in Christ, as I just mentioned, we have a prodigal class. Many of us have prodigals that were raised up taught on the truth. I have a prodigal. I understand that. 
That's a choice they make as they get older. But we have to be proactive as parents and, and share Jesus with them and talk about it. And we're going we're gonna to be talking about this as we move through here. So we're going to be talking about the role of the parent and, of course, the role of the child as well. So we're going to be looking at the first four verses tonight. And just follow along as I read. Um, Paul is writing, of course, to the Ephesian church, and he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. So first we have God's design for children, and, and then God's design for parents and, and we're going to be kind of crossing over, of course, as we move through here. But let's talk, first of all, to children. And there are really two aspects that I want to draw out of these three verses here. And that would be this, the act and the attitude. The act of obedience and the attitude of the heart. So first of all, the act of obedience. Verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. The word children there, by the way, techna literally means, sometimes we think of little kids, the word simply means offspring. So think of it this way. Anyone who is still living under the roof of their parents' home is to live in obedience to them. And I think we can all relate to that, right? Because didn't your parents tell you that? Listen, as long as you live under this roof, you'll do what I say. They were right on. That's, that's exactly what this means. That's biblical. By the way, when you move out of the home, there's still supposed to be the element, the attitude of honor. And we're going to talk about that. That's kind of the second part. But this word obey, hupakuo, means to come underneath and listen to or listen under. The children, he's saying, get underneath your parents and listen to them. Every parent's saying amen to that, right? But it also has the idea of not only listening but doing. And, of course, that's James 1.22. Don't be hearers only but doers of the word. So children are to get under the instruction of their parents. And by the way, this is a present imperative, which means to continually do so. So if you're a kid here tonight, it's not just when you want to. It's not just when you feel like it. It's continual. It's not a suggestion. It, it's a command. And it takes us all the way back to the Decalogue, right? The, the Ten Commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments, as you know, are divided into two sections. The first half deal in our relationship with God. The second half deal in our relationships with others. So you have the first four commandments dealing with God, the next six dealing with others. But here's the thing. The very first commandment dealing in our relationship with others is this, the fifth commandment, Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and your mother. Why deal with the parent-child relationship first? I'll tell you why. Because all human relationships are based on what we learn in the home, what we learn in childhood. If respect and honor and obedience is learned in the home, that's going to translate into all of our other relationships, especially with the Lord. But if it's disregarded in the home, man, you're putting that child off in a bad foot from the get-go. And so children, obey your parents. And of course, the scriptures talk about this so much. The book of Proverbs is, I could fill the rest of the evening with it. But let me share a few. Proverbs 1.8 says, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and don't forsake your mother's teaching. Proverbs 4.10 says, Listen, my son, to what I say, and your years will be many. God will bless your life. Proverbs 8.33 says, My son, listen to my instruction, and be wise. Don't ignore it. And then I like Proverbs 12, one, one more. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. That's just a good one. Now, we don't allow the S word to be spoken in our home. I think I shared that last time, stupid. So, not wise. Let's put it that way. But a generation that is undisciplined and, uh, and disobedient is going to have huge problems in the future. And, of course, this is what we see in our society. In fact, our society today is telling uh, children that they should liberate themselves from their parents. And, of course, we know that there are those who have successfully sued their parents and gained whatever freedom they thought they had, only to be disappointed, I'm sure. So there are people that believe that, parents sh uh, that children should be able to do whatever they think is right. But listen, whenever we veer from biblical standards, you're always going to have a problem. In fact, let me say this, and maybe you didn't know this. You know, the Bible talks nothing about rights. 
That's a big buzzword, right? It's, it's a, you know, people's rights, children's rights, human rights, women's rights, men's rights, on and on and on, right? Listen, the Bible never talks about rights. The Bible talks about responsibilities. And when we push ourselves for our rights, that's when we have relationships weakened. When a man is saying, this is my right, woman's my right, the kid's my right, we weaken the relationships. By the way, the idea of children being disobedient to their parent is one of the signs of the end times, which, of course, we've been studying on Sunday. Let me read it to you. In 2 Timothy 3, 1, yeah, Paul says, In the last days, this is what's going to happen. People will be lovers of themselves. Okay, that's today. Lovers of money, yes. Boasters, yes. Proud. Blasphemers, yes. And disobedient to parents. So children need to obey their parents. Now, here's the reality. As parents, then, we need to train them. And again, we're going to talk about that, but I said some of these things are going to cross over. And why do we need to train our, parents, our children to be obedient? Because they aren't naturally obedient. That's why. They're sinners. As soon as those little bundle of joys arrive on the scene, they're just so cute. And it doesn't take long for them to, you know, all of a sudden become little selfish me people. You know, it's all about me, right? Um, you leave a, ch a group of kids unattended in a room. If you were to take a bowl of, or a plate of freshly baked chocolate chip cookies, you know that aroma? You know how good fresh chocolate chip cookies smell? Can you smell it right now? I can. I'm, I haven't eaten dinner. I, I just, wow. But if you took a plate of that and you put it in a kid, a room of 20 toddlers, said, now, now don't touch this, just, just leave it alone. You know, if you leave the room for a few minutes, you have a much chance of finding a pot of gold in your backyard as you do finding those cookies there. Because that's the way kids are. They do what they want. And if you have young kids, you hear mine and mine and me and I want all these things. So we have to teach our children to be selfless and to obey. We have to be proactive at it. If not, if a child left to his own, what a, the Bible says he becomes a ruin to himself. I, I think of it as, uh, you know, if you want your yard to, to look nice, you have to work at it. If you don't, do nothing. Listen, do nothing to your yard. Just let it go, right? Let it go, let it go. Just let it go. And you know, your yard will it'll have weed. In, in here in Texas, you'll have weeds this high in about two weeks, right? And just going all over the place. If you want it to, you know, be obedient and look nice, you got to work at it. You got to pull out the weeds. You got to mow. You got to do that on a regular basis. And that's what we need to do with our children. Now, I'd like you to turn somewhere. I'd like you to turn to Luke chapter 2, if you would. So hold your finger here. Turn to Luke 2. So, the beginning of the New Testament is Matthew, Mark, Luke. So make a left. Luke chapter 2, the Gospel of Luke. And uh, I want to read about Jesus when he was a uh, young man. Most likely about 12 years old. You're familiar with it. Luke 2, 51. We read this. Then he, that's Jesus, went down with them, that's Mary and Joseph, and came to Nazareth, and check this out, was subject to them. That means he was obedient. Children are to obey their parents. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. So Jesus was obedient. Children be obedient. And Jesus, because he was obedient, increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. This gives us insight to what children lack. They lack, they lack four things. They lack wisdom. They lack stature. They lack favor with God. They lack favor with men. Or to put it another way, they need to grow mentally, physically, socially, and spiritually. First of all, they need to grow in wisdom, right? They come, our kids come to this world, they have a blank mind, right? They don't have much knowledge, and they certainly don't have any discernment. We have to teach our children to be discerning, to make right judgments, right? You leave a kid to themselves who knows what they'll do. Even a teenager, listen, if a teenager had their choice, or a teenager, what do you mean, a 13-year-old, 14-year-old guy, if they had their choice to do whatever they want, if you left, you know what they'd eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Fruit Loops. Good grief, that's what I had when I was out of the house, when I was a bachelor. Not too wise. 
Because kids are undiscerning, so they need to be taught how to be wise. They need to grow in wisdom. They need to grow, obviously, physically, and we do that. When they're young, we do everything for them. We feed them, we change their diapers. We, but we, as they get older, we even need to provide for them because they can't do that. They have to grow in that area. And then thirdly, they have to grow socially. The moment children come into this world, they are selfish. They're consumed with themselves. They're self-centered. Again, as I said, we just hear those words, mine, or I want, all the time. So we have to teach them how to share with other people socially. And then ultimately, they need to grow spiritually. A child left to themselves will fall into rule, uh, ruin. And the truth is, children on their own don't automatically obey God. Listen, they don't automatically obey their parents, and they don't automatically obey God. So we have to teach them about the Lord. And this is why God said, remember to the children of Israel, all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy. It's in what is called the Great Shema. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, God says in verse 5, you shall love the Lord with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And then he says this, these words I command you today, they need to be in your heart as parents, and you need to teach them to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up teaching them all the time. There's a Chinese proverb that says, one generation plants the trees, the next generation gets the shade. So are we planting trees? Are we planting truth in our children and that they enjoy the shade, the truth of God's word, and that they in turn do the same thing? We have to instruct them. All right, you can go back to Ephesians 6. And again, we're, we're training our children in the Lord, but... Children, you're to obey your parents, notice, in the Lord. In other words, that pleases the Lord. There's a uh, companion verse to this in the book of Colossians. Colossians 3.20 says, Children, obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. It, ultimately, you should be obeying your parents, kids, because it pleases God. But when it, means, or when it says here, in the Lord, it also means something else. It means as your parents are giving you commands, you're obeying those things that are in the Lord. In other words, even though you're told to obey your parents, that's not a carte blanche for parents to put something on their kids that is unbiblical and expect them to obey it. If a parent tells their child, you know, I want you to steal, or I want you to take drugs, or you want you to do something that's unbiblical, then at that place, that's, that's not in the Lord. And in that situation, obviously, they don't have to obey their parents. I think of Daniel... Uh, who was taken into captivity. He was a teenager, but he was a godly man. And as a godly young man, he was told, you can't pray. So what did he do? He prayed. <laughs> Got thrown in a lion's den. Of course, God protected him. But ultimately, why do children obey their parents? I, I love this. I love this verse right here. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Here it is. For this is right. Don't you love it? I mean, God just gets right down to the point of the matter. Why do, you, why do I have to obey my parents? Because it's right. I mean, some kid might argue, well, where are the case studies? Where's the psychological evidence? Where are all the opinions of men? Well, we don't need that. When God says it, it's right. It's right. God says, obey your parents. That's what we need to turn around our society. So the act of obedience. Now, let's move on and talk about the attitude of the heart. Because this is where it really gets important in verse 2. It says, honor your father and your mother. Honor is the attitude. It's the attitude behind the act. When a person really honors their parents, when they respect their parents, the obedience will just naturally flow, right? And again, this is what God said in the fifth commandment. Honor your father and mother. And so God wants us to do the right thing outwardly. But in order to do it, really, it comes from the heart. And uh, I've shared this story with you before, but I've dealt with it in, in my own, uh, you know, parenting. You know, about the father that was driving down the road, and he noticed he'd, he had just told his, his little one, the toddler, well, it was actually a four-year-old, to get into the car seat. You could strap it in. And that's what I'll tell, you know, uh, the kids, my grandkids. I have a four-year-old, and he has to get in the booster seat, and I just let him put it in there himself. You know, of course, I double-check it before I take off. But the father just told the little girl, get in the car seat, you know, and he took off. And he looked back there, and she's not in the car seat. In fact, she's jumping up and moving around. He says, hey, looking in the rearview mirror, you need to get in the car seat. Because, you know, getting an accident is dangerous. And she just ignored him altogether. 
and she wouldn't strap it in. So finally, he pulls over, right? He gets out of the car. I told you to put that thing on. He puts it in there, and he, you know, makes sure she's safe. Now he gets back on the road, and he looks up there, and, and he says, I'm glad you're in the car seat now. She goes, listen, Daddy, I may be sitting on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. <laughs> now that's a little kid that needs a little board of education to the seat of understanding, right? <laughs> But that's the attitude of not, ha you know, the outward act's okay, but the attitude is wrong. And so this is why God says, children, we're to honor our father and mother. We're going to set them in a high esteem. It's something that we do while we're living in the home, but now going to that aspect of even moving out of the home, it's something we knew when we move out. And not to do so is dishonoring to God. Even to the point of honoring your mother and father, even when they get older, would be to the point of even supporting them when they get older. And Jesus addressed this very issue in Matthew chapter 15. We were there, uh, what, probably about six months ago. But Jesus brought up this very issue. The religious leaders were not honoring their mother and father, Jesus says that specifically, in the fact that they were neglecting to support their parents. And they were using the excuse of saying, well, you know, I'd really like to support my parents, but I've given all my money to the church, to the temple. It's dedicated to the Lord. It sounded so spiritual. But they were disregarding God's commandments. So Jesus said this in Matthew 15, 5. Whoever says to his mother and father, whatever profit you might have received to me, I've given as a gift to God, then he doesn't need to honor his mother and father. By doing so, you've made the commandment of God of no effect for your man-made tradition. What a sham, Jesus said. He said, you're a hypocrite. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So they, their heart is not right. Their attitude is not right. So we are to honor our mother and father. That, that carries on when they get older. I know I've shared with my parents on many occasions. And uh, hey, you know, if it ever comes to that point and you need help, you know, you're welcome to, to live here. I don't know where I'm going to put you. I guess I'm going to sleep on the couch. I don't have another room in my house. But we would work out something. We need to take care of our parents. That's honoring them. Notice he says, honor your mother and father, which is the first commandment with promise. The fifth commandment had a promise. It's a twofold promise. He says it here in verse 3, that it may be well with you and you may live along on earth. So first, as we honor our parents, we receive a quality of life. It'll be well with you. God promises a good life, a quality of life, and then secondly, a quantity of life. And you may live long on the earth. Now, this doesn't mean you're going to live forever, but it does mean you'll live a good, full life as God intended for you. So when we honor our parents, we receive God's blessing. Let me give you a few examples, and there are many in the Bible. Samuel, a young boy, placed under the guardianship of, Sam, of Eli the prophet. He was obedient to him. And because of that, God established him as one of the greatest prophets of Israel. David, as a young boy, obeyed his father. Even when he was kind of disregarded and kind of left out in the field when the other brothers came to be, you know, you know to be checked out to be king. But the reality is because of his obedience to his dad, he became Israel's greatest king. Esther, a godly girl raised by her uncle, obeyed God. God raises her up to the queen of the greatest nation at that time, and through her, God spares the Jewish nation. Daniel, a teenager who lost his parents, but he was taught the scriptures as a young boy, and as a teenager, God used him to be the wisest man, of course, in the kingdom of that town, of that, that nation, and a man of renown. So when children obey their parents, there is a blessing, and there are countless, countless examples. So God's design for the child is what? Obedience. The act of obedience motivated by an attitude of the heart that says, I choose to do this because it brings order. It pleases the Lord, and it's right. Now, let's talk about parents. And again, we're going to cross over back and forth, but just one verse. He says, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Now, if you look at that there, you'll see there's really, there's two commands. There's a negative command, you know, don't do this. And then there's a positive command, bring them, do this. So we'll look at both of them. First, there's a negative command. 
And you fathers, do not, don't do this. Don't provoke their, your children to wrath. Now, when he says fathers here, it could be translated father as it probably is in most of your translations. And that would make sense in the fact that Paul's addressing the head of the home, which then, of course, trickles down uh, to the mother and the father and to the children obeying them. But the word can also be translated parents and is so translated, same word translated in Hebrews 11.23. And I believe that's really what Paul has in mind. He's addressing the parents, first the children and then the parents. But here's this, this negative command, don't provoke your children. The word provoke literally means to exasperate, to exasperate your children. In other words, uh, doing things to them that frustrate them, that can cause them anger or can cause them not to obey you, you see? Paul says, as, as stewards of our children, given this wonderful grace, don't exasperate them. So that said, I thought what would be best is just to give you a few examples of what exasperates children. I think you'll track with these pretty easily. Number one, you want to exasperate your children? Don't spend any time with them. Don't spend any time with them. Surveys actually say that the average father spends only a few minutes a day with his young children, a few minutes a day. What could be more discouraging to a child than a phantom father? That discourages a child. To want to be obedient to someone who tells me, do this and do that, but he's never around. So we need to spend time with our children. Spend time with them, sit with them, play games with them. Um, just do whatever they want. It's, it's amazing how little time you do that, and all of a sudden, man, the joy comes out of their life. Spend time with them. When they come home from Sunday school, go over the lesson with them. Reiterate it in their mind. Spend time. Secondly, we can exasperate our children by never trusting them. Just never trusting them. Or you might say overprotection. Nothing they do earns our trust. And because of that, they get exasperated. They get discouraged. Yes, rules and guidelines, of course. But don't draw the line so fine that you box them in and they can never earn your trust. We need to look for ways to say yes as well as no. When you're always saying no, that exasperates them. Thirdly, we can exasperate our children, discourage our children by comparing them to others. Maybe favoritism, right? Um, think about this. Isaac favored... Uh, Esau over Jacob, Rachel favored Jacob over Esau, same family, major problems, major problems. Their descendants today, major problems. So we can't compare children with children. Some of you have a lot of kids. You can't even remember their names. You got so many of them. <laughs> some have a food, but, and some of you don't deal with that, but you know, it, it's kind of like, well, how come you can't get A's like little Herman? Or how come you can't be like little Hermione? She always does this thing right, you know. And, and you, you start, you say that, you start comparing the kids, and, and the kid feels like a second-class citizen is home. Why I, I, I can't be that way? And here's the thing. If, in a if a child can't feel secure in their own home, where can they feel secure? Well, I'll tell you what they'll do. As soon as they get a little bit older, they're going to go outside the home to find security in someone else. Fourthly, we can discourage our children by depreciating their worth. You know, it's like having company over and saying, go stay in your room for two hours. We got company. You don't want to do that. Or it could be even like, you know, they hear you saying something like, hey, well, we'd like to go out with you, but we can't. We've got the kids. You know, well, that, that's discouraging for the kids. If you have children, spend time. Go out with other couples that have children and let them have fun. Let them run around. Have them have a good time. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have times without the kids because you should. We talked about that in talking about marriage. You know, you need to have a time just husband and wife. And you need to have a babysitter with the kid and so forth. But there needs to be a balance and the kids need to know that you love them being around, as I know most of you do. Um, let me also say this. Don't ever say things demeaning to your kid. You're stupid. What an idiot. I mean, my goodness, that's really going to make a child feel just low in their, in their home. And if something comes out and you said something bad like that, man, be quick to apologize and make it right. Fifthly, we can exasperate our children by never rewarding them. You know, we always look for the bad things that they do, right? 
And that's easy to do as a parent, especially as they get a little older. How come your room's not clean? How come you didn't finish your homework, right? How come you don't like that? Uh, I do this. How come you didn't do that? You know, all these things. So we have to work hard, and we really do. I remember us coming up with a list, uh, uh, my wife and I, to come up with things that were actually good. Okay, let's look, for, to, to be proactive, to look for good things. So look for things to say, hey, that was great. That was good. Hey, I really appreciate you picked up that paper. Hey, I really appreciate the way you did this, you know. Now, if, if kids are, if you have teenagers, that gets really hard, right? It really does. Um, Dave, I, I love what you've done with your room. Is this early caveman? What is this? That smell, that's, uh, that's uh, muskox or whatever that is. That must be in, you know. You, but you're looking for ways to encourage them. Number six, we can provo provoke our children by pushing achievement. Man, a lot of parents do this. They're pushing achievement on their kids to want to live through their kids, whether it's, you know, uh, intellectual achievement, you know, scholastic achievement, or it's sports achievement. You know, this is the guy that gives his kid a football, a baseball, a bat, a basketball, while the kid's in the nursery room, you know, right there at the hospital. All right, kid, knock up. You're going to do it, you know, and you put this pressure on them. I remember playing, I remember one year, and I played Little League, uh, you know, just many, many years. But I remember one year, um, I was on this one particular team, and we were in the playoffs. And we, we were feeling all this pressure of being in the playoffs, not so much us as kids, but the pressure all of our families placed on us, right? And then the coach on top of it, he had a son on our team, and the coach was so, you know, just, you know, wigged out. Him and the other coach got in a full-blown fist fight in our playoff game. And I'm thinking, what? And it's just crazy. And so there's this tendency to push, you know, our children to be overachievers. Yes, we need to give them goals, of course. But don't exasperate them by expecting, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do that. Man, that discourages them. Number seven, we can provoke our children to anger, exasperate them by never letting them act as kids. And this is a danger, you know. It depends. Some, some, ki some parents let their kids act like kids too much. And that's the parents just let their kids run around all the time. Whoa, woo, okay, now you got to harness them in. They little need a little bit of discipline. But some go the other way, and they never let them act like kids, right? You got to always, you know, they're like this, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, you know, and they're just like, they're like robots. You don't want to do that. That's exasperating. I remember one time, um, so many funny occasions, you know. Uh, we, used to, we used to tell our kids, uh, say to ourselves when our kids did something dumb, sit up and act like you're 30, you know, because we, we'd say it as a joke to ourselves, reminding ourselves they're not 30. Uh, but I remember one time we put our kids in the backyard, and we just had a cement slab out there, and, the, and it rained a bunch of days. It was all wet and muddy, but they wanted to get out. They were kind of stuck inside the whole time. I said, okay, stay out here in the slab and, you know, you know, just play outside for a little bit, and turned away for about five minutes and looked out, and they were just like totally mud, head to toe, was all over them. I mean, just, you could hardly just see their eyes through all the mud. And at first, like, I can't believe those kids. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's like, wait a second. They don't get to do this all the time. So, you know, we got out the camera. It was a Kodak moment. Um, those of you who are young, you don't know what that term means. What's a Kodak? <laughs> it was an iPhone moment. You know, you get the idea. But we got to let kids be kids. Um, number eight, we can discourage our children by never communicating verbal or physical love. Man, I, I can't think of a day where our kids grew up in our home. We didn't hug them. We didn't tell them we love them. And I love to do that with my grandkids. Number nine, you can discourage your children by having a lack of rules. Sometimes you think, well, we have too many rules. You know, but yes, no rules exasperates a child as well. Do you realize your children want parameters? They're not going to tell you that. Hey, mom and dad, I really want some parameters in my life. They're not going to say that, but they really do. And when they think they can do anything and get away with this and stuff, they're thinking, do they really love me? So no rules will exasperate them as well. And then, of course, finally, we can provoke our children by um, excess discipline, you know, verbally, emotionally, and, and even physically abusing a child. So Paul says, don't exasperate your children. And one person wrote this, if a child lives with criticism, he learns to condemn. If a child lives with hostility, he learns to fight. If a child lives with fear, he learns to be apprehensive. If he lives with pity, he's always feeling sorry for himself. If he lives with jealousy, he learns to feel guilty. But if a child lives with encouragement, he learns confidence. If a child lives with praise, he learns to be appreciative. 
If a child lives with recognition, he learns to have goals. If he lives with fairness, he learns what justice is. If he lives with honesty, he learns what truth is. If he lives with acceptance, he learns what love is. So those are just some good things. Now, that's the negative commandment. We've got a little bit of time. Let's talk about the positive commandment. He says here in verse 4, but bring them up. So this is a positive thing. The word bring, of course, is a verb. It speaks of action. This is something we need to do. We need to bring them up. Bring them up in training. That word literally means, that word training says bring them up in discipline. That's what it means. Now, bringing them up with, with guidelines. Guidelines that give rewards for doing what is good and correction for what is doing wrong. So it's rewarding your children for what is right. It's disciplining when they do something wrong. So that's the idea. And when we do that properly, our children will obey us in the Lord. And here's the thing. By correcting them, by disciplining them, um, we make their hearts pliable uh, to the Lord. Proverbs 29, 15 says, The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame. And so Proverbs 19, 18 says, chasten a child, discipline a child while there is still hope. In other words, while they're young, discipline them, train them. Don't wait through their teenagers. It's, it's too late at that point. So how do we train them or discipline them or chasten them? That's what this word means. How do you do that? Well, in our home, we used four forms of of discipline. Just going to get real practical. First of all, we had time out. Some of you time out, right? When they did something, you know, hey, settle down. <laughs> settle down. Knock it. Go in the corner. You need to chillax. Put your face in the corner and stand there. Don't sit down. Don't do this number. You know, Ugh. stand in the corner with your nose in the corner. That teaches them discipline, teaches them focus. So if you're a parent, you do time out, but they're just like, mm, I'm time out in the corner doing this number. That's not discipline, okay? Secondly, we would ground them. If we, they were over at a kid's house playing, we said, now when we call you, we want you to come home. And we call them, come on home. No, I want to do this. Or they, they meander, I'm calling you again. Come on home. Well, or they throw, I don't want to come home. Okay, it's fine. Now you're grounded. Now we're going to ground you for a season of going over there because you're not obedient. A third way we discipline our children was washing their mouth out with soap, the old-fashioned way. I mean, people still do that? Oh, yeah. But listen, if you do that, we had to do it twice on one and once on the other. That's it. If you're, I, put, I, I was like, can I really do this? I put some soap on my mouth. Oh, my God. It is terrible. It's disgusting. But I'll tell you what, it worked. No more foul language coming out of those mouths. And then uh, finally, we used corporal punishment. In our home, we used a wooden spoon. We kind of used that as the rod. And when there was blatant rebellion, you know, we're not going to do that. I'm not going to, you know, then, okay, well, let's come over here. We're going to come. We get them alone. We didn't do that in front of anybody else. Take them into the bedroom. Explain to them, do you know why you're, you're going to get a spanking? Well, well, look at me in the eyes. We always make sure, make sure your kids look at you in the eyes. Don't let them do this number. We're not even giving a first base until you look in the eyes. You look in the eyes. Do you know why you're going to get disciplined? Yes, sir. Okay. Now bend over. You get a spanking. And afterwards, look at me. I just want you to know I love you. So we would love on them, hug them, and pray with them. And, you know, listen, the one thing you never want to do is you never want to uh, discipline a child in anger. That's the worst thing you can do. And in fact, let me say this, this word training, which means discipline, discipline is not something you do to your child. Discipline is not something you do to your child. It's something you do for your child. Do you understand? You're doing it for them to help them, to train them as they grow older. So Paul says, bring them up in the training, which means the discipline and the admonition. Admonition means uh, verbal instruction or verbal teaching. So you bring them up, disciplining them and verbally telling them what is right. And again, that takes us back to Deuteronomy 6. You're talking about the Lord when they sit down, when they rise up, when they walk along the way. So what you want to do is you want to, man, you want to verbally talk about the Lord all the time. So you're having devotion with him. Our children had devotion with us from the time they were infant. We just sit because when they were infant, they were having devotion with us. And then when they were one and two, we're translating that with a little tiny devotional. And we did that all the way until they left the home. We had devotion with our kids every morning. Now, when they became teenagers, the devotion was sex nonstop. 
That was pretty much, that was pretty much par for the course. From about thir- uh, 13 to 18, we just talked about sex every single morning. I mean, they're thinking about it every single morning, so we might as well be talking about it every single morning and what God thought about it. So. But you're, you're verbally talking about the Lord, and we're praying with them in the morning, and we're praying with them every night, playing Christian CDs, watching uh, Christian DVDs. Back in the day, you know, it was uh, VHS tapes. We just wore veggie tails out so that <laughs> the tape just destructs, right? Now we have it on DVD, and I'm watching it with the grandkids. And then you're looking for every situation to weave... Um, uh, life situations and talk about the Lord. What would the Lord do in that situation? What do you think about this? What would Jesus do? You know, when we talk about it, all experience it going through the Word of God. That's the idea of training them, discipline, and the admonition in the Lord. All right, we're out of time. Let me, let me close with this. There was a father who wrote these words. His, his children were grown up, and this is what he had to say. I, these are good words to close on. He said, my family is all grown. The kids are all gone. But if I had to do it all over again, this is what I would do. I would love my wife more in front of my children. I would laugh with my children more at our mistakes and our joys. I would listen more, even to the youngest child. I would be more honest about my weaknesses and and stop pretending perfection. I would pray differently for my family. Instead of focusing on them, I'd probably focus more on me, change me. I would do more things with my children. I would be more encouraging and bestow more praise. I would pay more attention to little things and deeds and words and love and kindness. And finally, if I had to do it all over again, I would share God more intimately with my family. I would use every ordinary thing that happened in every ordinary day to point them to God. So, children, obey your parents and the Lord. This is right. With an act of obedience that comes from an attitude of rightness from the heart. Parents, don't exasperate your children, but love them enough. Love them enough. The hard thing, the easy thing is to let them do whatever they want. The hard thing is to train them in the admonition of the Lord. Let's pray.